Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for this time, for this opportunity that you've given to gather as one and to look into your word, to study the things of your word, to, Lord, focus on truth in the midst of a world full of lies. We pray you'll open our eyes and we pray that you'll enlighten our minds and that you will warm our hearts and that you will give us hope and direction. We come at this time and the people have gathered here and those who are watching to your mighty hands we pray you will minister through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today I want to speak about the Christian life as war. <laughs> as war, right? There is a side to the Christian life where it's like war or it's like battle after battle. A war involves many battles and the Christian life has many sides to it, but this is one of its um, angles or you know, this is one way we should view the Christian life. We should view it as a series of battles or as war and that we are soldiers fighting this war. We should think like that. I think it is biblical to think like that. And I think it is because people sometimes don't think like that, that they suffer unnecessary defeat, unnecessarily become discouraged, unnecessarily lose their peace of mind, and sometimes even give up. It is because people don't think of the Christian life like this. You see, there are many sides to the Christian life. That's why I said it's one of the, you can't just describe the Christian life as war because there are other sides to it. There is the side of blessing, immense blessing. There is the side of, uh, you know, inward peace and joy. There are different sides to the Christian life, but one of the ways we need to think about the Christian life is that we are soldiers in the middle of a war, whether we like it or not. And we need to approach the Christian life in that manner. And I feel like because people don't know or don't approach it like that, they really face unnecessary defeat and sometimes even failure. Every week I meet people who are saying to me, you know, I'm going through this or that struggle. People come for prayer and uh, Everybody's going through all kinds of struggles. But what I want to say is, in about half the cases from what I've seen, I mean, certainly I'm not very experienced, but you know, I'm meeting people every week, praying for them. From what I've seen, in about half the cases, the people seem to be surprised and even shocked that uh, they're having all these challenges. It's one thing to say, okay, how do I overcome this challenge? But it's another thing to say, or imply that uh, this shouldn't even be happening. And that's the feeling I get from many people who come for prayer, is they seem to think this shouldn't even be happening. There shouldn't even be so much challenge, so much problem in life. Why is it there, that kind of a thing? And that's what motivates me to teach about this. We need to understand this side of the Christian life. And uh, we need to understand the uh, tactics of the enemy a little bit <laughs> so that we can be well prepared. And we need to understand how to fight. All these things, that's the kind of things I want to talk about today. Paul says, uh, we are not ignorant of the devices of the enemy, right? Second Corinthians 2. 11, we are not ignorant of the devil's uh, tactics, he says. <laughs> that means we know. Uh, Paul says he knows. And uh, certainly through the word of God, God reveals to us some of the tactics of the devil. And what he has revealed to us is enough if we would pay attention. So that, that's what we want to look at today. This, this side of the Christian life, that is the fact that we need to approach the Christian life as a war and uh, we are soldiers in the battle, so to speak, you know. So let me just uh, try to give you some truths and its implications. 
Number one, troubles will come. Therefore, don't be surprised. Instead, be ready. <laughs> troubles will come. Challenges will come. This is not uh, rocket science. This is not uh, uh, advanced spiritual truth or anything. But I think some people need to hear this. Some people don't know. Some people know, but they forgot. They need to be reminded. Troubles will come. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. In this world, you will have tribulation. John 16, 33. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. You know, the Bible portrays the Christian life in a very realistic manner. There is a grandness to the Christian life. There is a loftiness to the Christian life. You know, it promises all kinds of grand blessings to the Christian, both outward and inward, grand and great and lofty blessings are promised, but at the same time, the Bible acknowledges that in this world we will have all kinds of trouble. But in the midst of that, we can be encouraged because Jesus has overcome. That means, that implies we also can overcome, right? So that's the first thing, just let's start a little light. Troubles will come, which means if they're gonna come, then we should not be surprised when it comes. <laughs> the very presence of trouble should not rock us, should not shake us up. Just because it's come doesn't mean my life is in a mess. No, I think we don't have to have that kind of thing. I don't think that that kind of thinking is not biblical. Just because my life has all kinds of challenges does not mean this is uh, abnormal, shall we say. This is part of the normal Christian life is to face challenges. <laughs> Let me say that again. <laughs> Facing challenges of all kinds is part of the normal Christian life. The very presence of challenges, troubles, difficulties, temptations, eh? Whatever, whatever, various kinds, various levels, I'm saying. The very presence of those things does not mean you are having an abnormal Christian life, first of all, and you are having a life which nobody else is having. No. See, that itself is a lie of the devil. <laughs> he will tell us, oh, look at your life. Nobody is facing what you're facing. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> uh, Nobody is going through what you're going through. Oh, you know, poor you, you know and he'll lead you to throw a pity party. Wrong. All of God's people all around the world are facing some kind of trouble in various degrees and forms. That is the truth. This is the teaching of the Bible. The Bible does not say trouble or temptation will not come, but rather it says that uh, God will provide a way of escape. <laughs> that is what is promised. God will provide a way of escape, not you know, <laughs> troubles won't come. God will provide a way of escape. So, that's the first thing. Don't be surprised. Instead, be ready. Don't be surprised. Instead, be ready. Peter says in 1 Peter 4.17, don't be surprised at the fiery trial that comes your way. Yeah? Speaking about, in that context, it is... Uh, persecution. 1 Peter 4, 12. Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. <laughs> don't think something strange is happening. Don't be surprised when there's a trial like fire. He goes on to say, rejoice. The Bible is very strange in some ways. It says, don't be surprised when troubles come, rejoice. Peter says that in verse 13 here. James says that in James 1 and verse 2. Instead of being surprised that it's come, know how to handle it. What counts is how you respond in the middle of that. That's what will say whether you are a victorious Christian, you are a mature Christian, or not, right? The very presence of trouble does not mean you are a failure. It is how you respond to the trouble that shows whether you're succeeding or failing. So that's the first thing. It applies to all kinds of trouble. 
It applies to all kinds of, not just persecution. The verse here in Peter is persecution, but the verse in James is, look at James. The verse in James is certainly broader than persecution. It's not just persecution. It's across the board. James chapter 1 verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. It's not if you meet, but when you meet, which implies you will meet trials of various kinds, and when it happens, count it all joy. And you may think, is he crazy, count it all joy? Well, no, he's not. He goes on to speak of the reasons why we should count it joy. Verse three and four is the reason, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So there is purpose behind this, he says. There is a good end to all this. We believe that even the trials of various kinds can lead to a good end. And so count it joy, thinking of the end, thinking of the good effects that could come out of this, believe it or not. <laughs> so don't be surprised. Troubles will come. Don't be surprised. Instead, be ready. Instead, do what you can in your power to get ready for and learn how to face trials the biblical way. You know, look at passages like this, study them. It's going to come. If it's not already come, it's going to come. You learn how to face it. So that's the first thing. Troubles will come. Don't be surprised. Instead, be ready. Secondly, know who your enemies are. <laughs> know who your enemies are. And uh, the answer to that... <clears throat> The classic answer to that is your enemies are the world, the flesh, and the devil. The unholy trinity, shall we say. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Your enemies are not people. Your enemies are not even whoever you think you are, you know. Not just circumstances or things like that. But it's in the biblical language, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Ephesians 2, 1 to 3 is a passage which contains uh, all three of those uh, names, world, flesh, all three enemies. You can find in that one passage, Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. But let me just say a few words about each of those things, entities, the world. What do we mean by the world? Of course, we don't mean the good world which God made, and that's not an enemy. The word world is used uh, in different ways in the Bible. Uh, one meaning is the good world that God has made, but another meaning is the fallen world, the fallen world that has fell into sin and rebellion against God and his ways. Uh, so clearly, that is the meaning when we say the world is your enemy. We're talking about this fallen world, this world that is against God and godliness and the ways of God. The devil, you see, has influenced the world long enough and far enough so that now, even if you don't believe in the existence of a devil, you can still be influenced by the devil. <laughs> you know, there are people today who don't even believe in the existence of the devil, but according to the Bible, they're controlled by the devil. Why? Because they're controlled by the ways of the world and the ways of the world have been kind of directed by the devil. The ways of the fallen world. The devil is called in the Bible as the prince of the power of the air. The ruler of this world. Eh? The ruler of this world. Those are strong terms. The god of this age. The prince of the power of the air. And the devil, you know, so what we mean is the thinking that is prevalent in the world, the customs that are prevalent in the world, the way of approaching things, prioritizing things, the goals, and all these things that we find in the world sometimes are unbeknownst to people actually set by the devil from all kinds of areas and avenues have been penetrated by a sort of a evil agenda, you may say. You know, you can see it in entertainment, for example. You can see it uh, even in education, when they will remove God out of education, when they will teach science without God, for example. 
and even in a way that is against God sometimes. Huh? <laughs> subtle, those are small subtle things which people don't think much of. But what happens is through a certain type of education, a certain way of educating people and entertaining them and feeding them these slogans, you know, <laughs> the people are led into a totally different kind of thinking, into an ungodly way of thinking, you know. So it's mainly when we say the world, we're talking about thinking, we're talking about priorities, we're talking about a worldly kind of culture. 1 John 2.15 says, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So he mentions three things, the lust of the flesh. The worldly way is it desires whatever the flesh desires. The lust of the eyes, anything pleasing to the eyes, it wants it. The pride of life, there is a certain pride amongst uh, human beings in the world and uh, th that is not really pleasing to God. God himself gives uh, human beings a certain ego, I think. <laughs> he makes us in his image and likeness and thereby <laughs> there is a good ego, you know. <laughs> every human being is a self-respecting person. But then every time the devil twists the good things of God and he twists that good ego <laughs> into something very terrible, into something very prideful and arrogant and boastful. And that's what we see in the world. In all kinds of ways, the world draws us to think like it does, you know, through the entertainment, through its uh, little, little, you know, subtle messaging. <laughs> like we had a youth meeting on that day, I said, one line often they will use in the world is, follow your heart. Just follow your heart. I mean, that's just an ordinary line, but you will get into so much mess following your heart because your heart is not right <laughs> sometimes. Your heart is completely messed up. Your heart wants the wrong things. Your heart wants one thing today, another thing tomorrow. Your heart, you know, says, I love you today, and tomorrow says, I don't love you, you know. <laughs> but people have this slogan in the world, you know, follow your heart. Follow your heart. <laughs> As though your heart is the... <laughs> there are so many things like that in the world, you know, that sound so nice, and it's pushed through society, but it's a worldly way of thinking. It doesn't want to say, follow God, <laughs> so follow your heart. Or follow your dreams. What if your dreams are messed up? What if your dreams are totally against God? <laughs> no, don't follow your dreams. <laughs> no. Are your dreams from God? Are your desires from God? <laughs> See, there's subtle messaging happening in the world, which sometimes Christians are not aware. And we go right alongside the world and we kind of just, you know, <laughs> are impressed by all these things in the world. No, no, no. We should always think, is this according to the truth or not? We should always compare this kind of subtle messaging that's out in the world. People don't even realize it, but it's pushed all everywhere through media and entertainment and all that. <laughs> what you want is the most important thing. Really? No, it's not. <laughs> See, that's how the world will push that, you know. Huh? Individual freedom is a good thing granted by God himself. He's made us in his image and likeness with a free ability to choose. But it, if taken to the wrong extreme, it can totally mess up us, ourselves, and society. Huh? What we want is not always the most important thing. See, there are so many things like that. So we have to be on the lookout constantly you know, the flesh, not only the world, but the flesh. So the world is outside of us, the flesh is inside of me. Galatians 5.16 says, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. 17 says, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. There is a battle. My flesh wants something, but the Holy Spirit in me wants something else. There is an inward battle. Life is a war, as I said. If you know nothing of this inward battle, then uh, 
then I would say, whose side are we on, you know? <laughs> People in the world, complete unbelievers, know nothing of the inward battle. Because they are completely in the hands of the desires of the flesh. <laughs> it's like this, you know, you have a war, you have soldiers on both sides, they're fighting. So this soldier's on this side, this soldier's on this side, right? There are some who are not fighting. Where are they? They are prisoners of war. <laughs> they are locked up in the camp, they are not fighting. <laughs> they are not participating in any fight or turmoil but actually they are in a worse condition. <laughs> At least the soldiers who are fighting are better off. Some of these soldiers are captured and put and kept as prisoners. Some of the prisoners sometimes are brainwashed. <laughs> there are many people like that in the world, you know, unbelievers. They don't even have a turmoil within them between what is right and what is wrong. They just do whatever they feel like, whatever they want, that's it. They don't even feel much guilt about it. <laughs> but a true believer has this kind of inward fight happening. <laughs> yes, he's drawn by the flesh and the world on the one hand, but, but he's also drawn by the spirit on the other hand. And he has to make a choice. It's a battle. It's a fight. The desires of the flesh are against the spirit. The desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other. <laughs> I can give you more verses, but you, we all understand there is a pull within us to pull us in the wrong direction and ruin our lives. <laughs> we all understand that. It's very easy to understand. There is a pull from outside which kind of t tries to subtly just take us in the direction of the world, but there is a pull within us itself. We can't really blame the world alone because we have to blame ourselves. There's something inside of us which is pulling us in the wrong direction. The devil is the third enemy. He's a real person, you know. The devil is, or, or uh, he's a spirit. He's real. He really exists, contrary to what many people think in the modern day and age. And our fight is with him. His fight is um, with us, but more than that, with God, you may say. <laughs> Ephesians six twelve says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, that is, we don't wrestle against humans, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in the high places. He's saying we wrestle against demonic powers. The devil is against us. The more you are on God's side, the more the devil is against you. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? The more you are on God's side, the more the devil is against you. Very simple. Recently, a young boy was sharing with me. He's wanting to go into ministry. And uh, he's very young. Now only he's going to, you know, take the first steps towards that. He was telling me that he preached a small message to a group of 10 uh, youth. Just in a very small uh, kind of shed, you know. And he, he just preached a, a very simple kind of gospel message. <laughs> saying, give Jesus a chance. That was his message. <laughs> and he came to the close of that message about 30 minutes in, you know, and he came, brought it to a close, and he, and he started looking at some of the, among the 10 students there, many of them started crying, he says. They experienced some kind of a move of God in their hearts. And so he said, okay, if you want to accept Jesus, receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior right now, raise your hand, you know. <laughs> and... Uh, so he was leading them to a, through a prayer. This was in an inward uh, shed, he said. Uh, indoor, like it's, not, it's like a shed, completely closed with fans and all that, you know. In the middle of the prayer, before he finished the prayer, he says that uh, <laughs> right in the middle where they were sitting, a crow falls down, slit at the throat with blood splattering everywhere, even upon some of the students there. Crazy, just a crazy incident. And they had to stop the prayer. The students were terrified. They rushed out, you know. They all rushed out and they went out into the open and it was such a big commotion, it seems. All kinds of crows and this and that. They could not even finish the prayer. It terrified everybody. Then he came back and he got everybody and he said, Come, back, let's finish that prayer, you know. He's a young man. He's, 
when i heard it i mean i can't say that for sure the devil did it <laughs> but i do know the fact that the prayer was stopped there the students were terrified they all you know were scattered and he had to take great efforts to go get them and say we need to finish that prayer you know <laughs> the fact that all that happened that it makes me think you know i do know the devil is against people receiving jesus as their lord and <laughs> savior i do know the devil is against people repenting from sin and turning to jesus the devil may or may not be behind this incident but surely he is against this whole effort and it could be that this was a, a, you know because what are the chances of a crow getting caught in the fan falling right in the middle in the middle of the prayer and terrifying everybody it's totally just a freak incident so i told the young man i said well there's two le- lessons you can learn from this i think one is god is with you god is working through your preaching <laughs> he's doing amazing things you know for students to listen and cry and you know be moved to repentance like that is no ordinary thing i told him also the devil is probably against you <laughs> the devil doesn't like that you're answering god's call to go into the ministry but don't get scared you know just like you did go back and finish that prayer <laughs> whatever the devil tries to stop he cannot really stop we go back and we finish it but the thing is you see we should expect the devil to come against us because we are taking the war to the devil jesus said i will build my church and the gates of hades shall not prevail against it that means we take the war to the gates of hell we bombard the gates of hell we are rescuing people from the clutches of the enemy and so when we do that the devil is going to be against and we should not be surprised when the devil is against the devil is our enemy because the more we are on god's side the more the devil will be against us if we are sleeping on god's side then the devil also doesn't mind us much if we are not doing much for god if we are just you know you know if we are barely on god's side if we are not really having a kingdom agenda doing things for god you know we are just living like people of the world the devil is quite happy with us and he will leave us alone also he said go right ahead you've saved me some work but the moment you really get on god's side and you try to do his agenda and you bombard the gates of hell guess what he's going to come after you but we don't have to be scared of him no but all i'm saying is know your enemies the world the flesh and the devil thirdly know what the target is know what the enemy is after know what the target is what is the target let me give you a few things what is the target well if we want to start big the target is um, i think the glory of god the devil does not like the glory of god he hates god and his glory he hates wherever jesus is glorified i think that's his number one target it is not us <laughs> we are just uh, sort of you know what can i say we happen to be on god's side <laughs> otherwise he's not even going to bother with us <laughs> his number one target is the glory of god whatever he can do to tarnish the name and the glory of god the glory of jesus and keep his name from being glorified he will do that is why when we are trying to lead people to christ he will try to come and stop that is against the glory of god so we have to think in those terms i think we have to be aware of the tactics of the enemy you know so it, it looks like a uh, is after us <laughs> because the circumstances look like that but really he's after the glory of god when he comes against people in ministry through opposition he's after the glory of god when he comes against people in ministry through temptation he's after the glory of god <laughs> he likes it when a person in ministry falls to temptation and god's name is tarnished he loves that that's what he's really after he doesn't really care about the the preacher <laughs> he's after the glory of god 
And so when we are aware of that, we will be a little more alert, shall we say, watchful. It's not just about me, it's about the glory of God, you know. I think the devil is in some ways more clear than us. <laughs> Sometimes we only are not clear about the ultimate purpose of life. <laughs> what is the ultimate purpose of life? Why do you exist? Why do I exist? Why do the sun, moon and the stars exist? Why does the smallest insect in the deepest rainforest exist? <laughs> Why does the fish in the deepest part of the ocean exist? Why does anything exist? The Bible's answer is the ultimate purpose of all existence, all creation, is to glorify God. It is to show forth the glory of God. That's the ultimate. That's, that's as high as, as far as you can go. That's ultimate. Our purpose is to glorify God. Through our life, through our actions, through everything, you know. Everything exists for the glory of God. That's biblical teaching. I think the devil targets the glory of God. Whether or not we pursue the glory of God, the devil is targeting that. He's after defaming. He loves to defame God. Tarnish his name. So he tempts Christians. He tempts preachers into sinning. He discourages Christians into giving up. <laughs> Why? Because ultimately it is... God's glory that he's after. He destroys marriages. Why? Because marriage itself exists to show forth the glory of God. The purpose of marriage in the Bible is very clear. The ultimate purpose, there are many purposes of marriage too. For you to find a life companion, for you to bring forth children into this world, for you to be happy with your spouse, for you to grow in holiness together with your spouse that is growing in love. Eh? But the ultimate purpose of marriage is to show forth the glory of the relationship between Christ and the church. It is meant to be a display of that. And so the devil loves ruining marriages. <laughs> ruining fathers also. <laughs> when a father is not a good father, Guess what? See, why do fathers exist? To show forth the glory of the heavenly father only. But the devil is after earthly fathers, you know, drawing them, influencing them to act a certain way. And so what happens is the child does not even think a father is a good person anymore. <laughs> so when you tell them about a good heavenly father, it doesn't even make sense anymore to them. They can't even relate. That's what the devil likes. He loves to tarnish the glory of God. So we have to be aware, we have to be alert to all these things. And we also should be <laughs> after the glory of God, to promote the glory of God. While the devil is trying to tarnish the glory of God, we should have it as our ultimate purpose to promote the glory of God through our marriages, through our families, uh, through our relationships, through everything. <laughs> We should have that in our mind. I think if we have that in our mind, we will live a far more successful life in every area of life. This is a battle. We're in a battle. What is it? Stake is the glory of God. And God wants his name to be glorified in and through us. In and through us. We are the chief, what can I say, promoters of his glory. We are the chief reflectors of his glory. We are the ones out of all creation, we are the ones who are made in the image and likeness of God. We exist to image God, literally. Our whole purpose is to image God, to show the greatness of God. And the devil loves to flip that around, ruin man, make him look like he's nothing. Is one big failure because that could then reflect on God. See, we are in a battle. What is at stake is the glory of God. And we should have that in our mind as we face temptation, as we face discouragement, as we face all the kind of subtle pulls on this direction or that direction. What he's after is the glory. When he's discouraging a Christian, what he's after is the glory of God. Because when that Christian gives in to the discouragement, and becomes depressed. <laughs> Certainly God is not glorified. 
when a child of god gives in to these discouraging thoughts and all that and goes into that spiritual depression and just you know kind of just you think god is glorified no he's not especially if that person stays there now when they come out of it their god is glorified and you know the wonderful thing is god <laughs> always he never leaves his children he brings them out of it but i'm saying we should understand the devices of the devil that it's not just about us there is something higher at stake something there's a bigger target for the devil it's the glory of god and so i think that is the ultimate thing but then i can mention other targets your hope your faith he targets your faith we look at the target as our loved ones or our belongings or you know sometimes we see that the devil is targeting our family or our wealth or whatever right and we so we think only only on that level but the deeper thing is he's actually targeting our faith he just wants to destroy our faith make us give up our faith in christ make us give up our hope in christ we have to be alert to that so that even if we do face you know hardships in whatever family finances uh, health whatever it is we should recognize that this is ultimately an attack on our faith not ultimately but at least penultimately he's trying to make me give up my faith 1 Thessalonians 3:5 says Paul is writing to the Thessalonians saying i wanted to find out about your faith lest by some means the tempter might have tempted you and our labor might be in vain eh is after our faith jesus remember he prayed for the faith of peter particularly he predicted peter's denial and the way he speaks about it luke 22 simon simon behold satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat but i have prayed for you that your faith may not fail eh? yeah you may deny me you will deny me but your faith will not <laughs> as the most important your faith will not fail and when you have turned again strengthen your brothers he's after our faith so don't give up your faith that's the point if you know he's after something don't give that up yeah you may have lost this and that don't give up your faith just keep holding on to your faith in christ or rather keep holding on to christ keep holding on to christ don't loosen that grip because he's holding on to you he's also after your love I'm giving you some targets what is the enemy after know what the target is right you're in a war you should know what the target is the target ultimate target is the glory of god your faith your love the enemy doesn't want you to love god now when i say the enemy i'm saying the world the flesh and the devil right none of those things entities want us to love god first see let me put it like this love is the mount everest of christianity right that's what we're trying to aim for <laughs> love god love your neighbor and so on eh? and ultimately the bible says it is about love love is the greatest thing out of faith hope and love love is the greatest thing but what the enemy does is it'll make our, our love to be disordered you see human beings can't help but love something or someone human beings are created to love you just cannot be without loving something or someone you will love someone or something <laughs> you love people or you will love other things you know that's just the fact of life you can't get away from it god has placed desire and this capacity to love and it will find fulfillment somewhere now the question is where and the question is more importantly in what order because god himself commands us to love others god himself commands husbands to love their wives and i don't think it's wrong to <laughs> like good food and all these things the pleasures that god gives he put the taste buds in our tongue you know he gave us the capacity to run and play sports and exercise and derive pleasure out of that and so many things god himself has really made possible so the question is in what order are we to love that the bible says 
This is the order, love God first, love others second, love yourself <laughs> third. Or at least love God first and love others just as you love yourself. <laughs> you know what I mean? The Christian order is God first when it comes to love, God first, others second, you third. That's the order. How do I know? When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment, what did he say? The greatest commandment, he said, is the first of all commandments, Jesus said, is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like it. Verse 31, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Eh? So according to that verse, it's love God first, and for a tie, <laughs> Second place, you love others and your self. You other, love others just as you love your self. But then Jesus takes it up one notch higher in another place where he, in John 13, 34, he says, a new commandment, John 13, 34, a new commandment I give you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. And how has he loved us? <laughs> he put us ahead of himself on the cross. So he actually takes it up one notch higher than just loving your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> he sacrifices himself for the sake of his neighbors, <laughs> us. So that's why I say the Christian order is God first, others second, me third. Now that's hard. And notice the world flips it around exactly opposite. Me first, others second, God last. You think that's coincidence? <laughs> And that leads to a miserable life. That leads to a miserable life. You follow God's order, it'll lead to the most satisfying, fulfilling life. Not that there's no difficulty or sacrifice, certainly there is. But this is the kind of life human beings were made to live. A life where they love God first, love others second, and themselves third in that order, Guess what? That's when you'll be the happiest. <laughs> That's when you'll be the happy. People think if you put myself first, then I'll be happy. Wrong. <laughs> See, life is very strange, isn't it? <laughs> you put yourself last, you'll be the happiest. <laughs> you ask the people, you know, who actually did it. There are people who have, who have sacrificed much for the sake of others. And, and they find their happiness through that. And there are also people who refuse to do that and who thought the way is to always put themselves first. And ultimately they see that it leads to a total lack of fulfillment, a lack of happiness. They just feel empty on the inside. So what did we say? The target is what? Glory of God. What is the enemy after? He wants to tarnish the glory of God. He wants to make you give up your faith and ruin it. Eh? Make your loves all disordered, upside down, so that you end up in misery eh? and dissatisfaction. Eh? And uh, another target, let me say. He's after your destination. <laughs> He's against you reaching your destination. He's against you reaching your destination. You see, he knows, I think the devil, that's why I say, I think the devil knows something's better than us. He knows that God has a wonderful plan for us. <laughs> we may not know that, but the devil knows that God has a wonderful plan for us. And so he will do whatever is in his power to try to prevent that from happening. So that we don't reach our destination. And that is again tarnishing the glory of God. This is what he's after, you see. And so, for example, I'll just give you a small example, right? So, it looks like we're tempted to sin or give up. Yeah? Say a person in ministry is tempted to sin or is tempted to give up. What he's really after is he knows that if the person continues down that path, it is going to result in great fruit for the kingdom of God. Many lives changed, many lives transformed. You know, there are many people who are called to ministry, but the reason they have not entered ministry is they feel most unworthy about themselves. Why? 
their past. Their past. They've messed up. Some big mess up through sin or whatever. And so now they feel like they're disqualified for the ministry. That is exactly the devil's agenda. Now the truth is actually <laughs> past sin does not disqualify you for future ministry. It doesn't work like that. Now I know there's more nuance to it. But that is the devil's agenda actually. Just to remind somebody, oh you did this in the past. There's no way you can, you know, <laughs> be a missionary or go and work for God. That's his agenda, to stop us working for God. See, we should know how to deal with that past sin and guilt, take it before God, confess it and receive. See, that's what I'm saying. We should be aware of the devil's tactics. I believe that many young people are stopped from entering into the ministry simply because the devil makes them feel most unworthy, makes them feel like trash that they are not worthy to do this, and so they'll go into something else. <laughs> Who is worthy for God's calling? Nobody is worthy based on self-worthiness. Nobody can ever be worthy. God's calling is not based on our worthiness. God's calling is based on his pure mercy and grace. <laughs> he told Israel, Deuteronomy chapter seven, he told them, you know, I loved you because I loved you, that's all. <laughs> Not because you were a great nation. In fact, you were the smallest nation, he says. But I set my love on you. That's the way. In fact, I would say God calls the most unworthy people. Sometimes purposely to make the point. <laughs> In the eyes of the world, whoever is unworthy, he will call them, he will make them great, and he gets all the glory. The person gets no glory. That's the point. But the devil is in the business of making feel making people feel unworthy because he wants them not to go into that God's plan. Whether it's ministry or something else, this, this applies across the board, it's a principle. He's trying to stop you from reaching the destination that God has planned for you. And so you must be aware, we must be aware of this tactic and we must not give in to this. <laughs> We must not let our sense of unworthiness stop us from working for God, entering into the fullness of God's plan for us, or we must not let other things, you know, discouragement. Right, so the next point I want to say is, you will have to fight your whole life. <laughs> you must be prepared to fight, the, the entire Christian life is war. If you think that, uh, you know, <laughs> In this earthly life, there will be peace time spiritually, you are wrong. <laughs> it's an important principle. As long as this, see, our enemies are the world, the flesh and the devil. They are going to remain as long as we live this Christian life, yes or no? <laughs> or is the world going to stop being the world, you know? <laughs> is the flesh going to stop pulling me? No, it is going to pull. <laughs> In fact, you know, this is also one of the devil's tactics. Just when you think, oh, hereafter it won't pull me, that's when it'll pull. You remember David <laughs> fought all those battles? <laughs> Second Samuel chapter five, if you read it, it's a very impressive chapter. He goes and fights all these battles, wins battles and extends the territory of Israel. And then in, in Second Samuel chapter seven, the nation goes off to war and he's like on top of the world and he goes on top to the terrace, you know. <laughs> he's in a really good place, at least in terms of success and all that. And that's exactly when his flesh draws him into that sin. Many people have said that it is when they relax and think, oh, I'm over this now, you know, I'll never fall into this. That's when in fact they fall. Pride goes before the fall. See, the entire Christian life should be viewed as war. We will remain soldiers for this entire Christian life and we will fight this war. That's why Paul, when he comes to the end of his life, 2 Timothy 4, 7, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. <laughs> That's the apostle Paul coming to the end, very last of his life. The last book he's writing, last words. He's going to be martyred soon 
And he says, I've fought the good fight. He's talking about whole life as a fight. Finished the race, kept the faith. 1 Timothy 6, 12, he says, Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were called. You see, life is war. Why? Because the maintenance of your faith is a constant fight. The maintenance of your faith. I have kept the faith, he says. To maintaining faith is a lifelong pursuit. For our whole life, we have to maintain our, keep the faith, not lose our faith, not give up our faith. Jesus said, he who endures till the end will be saved. It means don't give up till the end. That's what it means. Your whole life is war. Whole life is battle. Don't expect the battles to go away. Don't expect the challenges to go away. So then what do we have? Well, we have victory promised to us. That's what we have. We have victory promised to us. We don't have to be afraid of the enemy. Enemy, even if it's 10 enemies or 100 enemies, we don't have to be afraid of the enemy. We don't have to be afraid of his tactics. We have to be aware And we have to know that victory belongs to the Lord and belongs to us, therefore. Victory belongs to us. That's what Jesus meant when he said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Means I have overcome, you just trust in me, you will overcome. That's what it means, right? Now, let me me say one other thing. I'll talk about how, how to fight a little bit. You have to know where the battlefield is also. Where is the battlefield? What do you think? The battlefield is in the mind. You fight the enemy in the mind. That's where you fight. In the realm of thoughts, imaginations, and so on. Your circumstances are not your enemy. Our circumstances are not our enemy. As bad as it may be, circumstances are not the enemy. Other people are not the enemy. And even if they were, you couldn't really do anything about it. That's not entirely within your power, is it? That is not entirely within our power. Circumstances and other people are not entirely within our power. What is within our power, so to speak, is our mind. (laughs) Now, I know that in cases of depression, it's very difficult because people have given into negative thought after negative thought to where now it's not just a few thoughts, it has now become a stronghold. And so the fight requires more, you have to fight more and more sustained effort and all that. But the the principle remains that we have to recognize that the, the enemy comes against us in the realm of the thoughts. And we also have to fight in that realm. How do we fight? We fight with the word of God or the truth of the word of God. That's our main weapon. You have different kinds of thoughts trying to bring you down. Discouraging thoughts, tempting thoughts, and not just discouraging and tempting. These are two big ones, right? But also... You may not be discouraged, you may not be tempted. You may just be coasting in life in a worldly way. (laughs) When I say you, I'm speaking generally, you know. (laughs) A person could be a very successful person in the eyes of the world. They're not really discouraged or depressed. And neither are they tempted into this uh, terrible sin or addiction or that or the other. They are doing quite well in their field, but they are doing nothing for God. There are people like that in the world, living a decent moral life, making a good name for themselves, coasting in life. (laughs) See, if you look at all these uh, kinds of living, discouraged, tempted, or just in pursuit of the wrong things, thoughts are behind all of that. Thoughts are behind all of that. And if you want to know how to fight it, you have to recognize this simple principle. The devil is a liar and he'll always feed you lies. You have to know what the lie is and what the truth is. And the moment you identify the lie and the moment you know how to replace it with the truth, the victory is yours. That's it, done. (laughs) So for example, he will discourage you saying, you will never amount to nothing. You will never amount to 
anything. Now that's a lie from the pit of hell. God never speaks like that. The Holy Spirit never speaks like that. You have to be clear. Whose voice is this? Some people are wondering, who is God telling me this? No, no, he's not telling me. <laughs> so we have to identify that as a lie of the, that, th- that thought should be identified. That is a wrong, that is a thought from the pit of hell and you should replace it with the truth of God's word. <laughs> you are a child of the living God. <laughs> you have to know certain truths, certain verses where you can immediately say, no, that's wrong. This is right. I believe this. I confess this, I will hold to this, and that's it, the victory is yours. It's like, you know, a dark room, you turn on the light, the darkness is gone. Same thing goes for tempting thoughts. Whenever we give in to temptation, we are giving in to certain lies. (laughs) What is the lie? This thing is really gonna satisfy me and bring me great pleasure, which also implies without it, I don't have much satisfaction or pleasure. Oh, this thing will give you really what you're looking for, which also implies God is withholding some good thing from me. It's like the Garden of Eden. The temptation for Eve is, if I take this, wow, you know, it looks good to the eyes. I think it tastes really good. And the devil is also saying it'll make you wise like God and all that, you know. It's the the promise of pleasure, the promise of profit, the promise of satisfaction. And we believe that promise. And that is why we sin. Nobody sins out of a sense of duty. (laughs) It's my duty to go and fall into sin. No, people sin drawn by the promise of pleasure or profit. But we have to identify that and say, no, I got a better promise. God has promised me better profit, better pleasure, and I will believe his word, and I refuse to believe. This is a lie. This is the truth. This temporary pleasure or profit will end up in long-term pain and loss. But God's pleasure and profit, which he does promise me, will end up in (laughs) long-term pleasure and profit without any loss or so you have to be count. You have to be able to counter these lying thoughts from the enemy. One suggestion I would give you is you should you should have some verses that are like go-to verses, <laughs> like go-to verses. You know what I mean? There are some promises that are so general that apply to all situations, right? Like for example, Romans eight thirty-two. In the heat of battle. <laughs> You, you should have some ready armor, right? If you know more truth, excellent, then you can pick a verse that is according to your situation. But sometimes people are not ready for that kind of uh, warfare, unfortunately. So, but, so at least you should have some, uh, some of these general verses, like Romans 8.32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also with him graciously give us all things, right? If God did not spare his own son, will he not do everything else for me? Uh, certain things, it'll apply to all situations, <laughs> this kind of verse or the truth behind this verse is what? The love of God manifest on the cross. Whatever problem in your, you can go to the cross, you can say God gave his son to die for me on the cross. I know a God who was willing to take pain and shame to the max for me. He's not gonna let me just like this depressed. He cares about me, he loves me. That's why he loved me to the death. You got to go back to those places. No point saying, I know the cross, I know God's love, I know Romans 8.30. You got to go to it in the moment of attack. In the moment of attack, you got to go back to those familiar weapons and use it, you know. What's the point of having a gun if you never use it? When the devil comes, we have warfare. When these negative thoughts come, we have warfare. We should not just sit there and say, oh, the thoughts are flooding my mind, I don't know what to do, we know what to do. This is what we do, we go to the word, we select the truth that will chase away that lie and bring us the victory, that's it. Very simple. 
The, sim- the principle is very simple. I know it's difficult to work it out sometimes. <laughs> the principle is very simple. You go, you're depressed, you go to the word. You're tempted, you go to the word. <laughs> and you fight till you get out of that. You fight till you get out of that. It may not be easy always, but you fight till you get out of that. You don't say, oh, I just tried, you know, for five minutes and nothing happened. No, you fight till you get out of that. This is a fight for life. You fight for your peace sometimes, you fight for your joy sometimes, you fight for your victory sometimes, but you fight for it until you get the victory. That's the kind of attitude we have to have, you see. We should not be surprised by the battle, and nor should we expect victory to always come just like that. No. But when the victory comes, I tell you, the longer it takes to come, the sweeter it'll be. And you'll find that your faith has grown, your mental strength has grown. See, there are Christians who go through very terrible circumstances, but they're very strong mentally. How? They've trained themselves to, and I know some people are naturally better off and some people are naturally worse off. (laughs) Some people are more prone to depression, just naturally they are very pessimistic by nature. They see the negative all the time. They they find it very difficult to see the positive. But whatever (laughs) our natural condition is, we are called to fight a war. Yeah, some people have to fight harder. Yeah, but so what? We fight. That should be the attitude. That should be the attitude. I fight till I win because I'm going to win because the victory is mine. I think as Christians, we have to take that attitude. Attitude is very important. This is where the world can teach us some lessons sometimes (laughs) because they will talk similarly and all that they talk is not wrong. (laughs) This is right. (laughs) You have to have the attitude of a winner, you know, and tell yourself that you'll fight until you win. As some preachers, including my father, have put it, the game is not over until you win. (laughs) The game is not over until you win and you will win because Christ has won. The past victory of Christ is the guarantee of our future victory. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the guarantee of our future victory. So I would say you should know verses like that, Romans 8.32 or Hebrews 13.5. I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's a verse that can apply to any situation or Isaiah 41.10, you know, fear not for I will help you, says the Lord. I will be with you, I will strengthen you, I will uphold you by my righteous. Uh, Open your mouth and in the fight you gotta use words, you know. Words are our weapon. The word of God is our weapon, which means we gotta open our mouth and say the words. You can't fight silently, by the way. (laughs) You cannot fight this battle silently, impossible. You have to open your mouth, go into a room, some you don't wanna do it in front of others, go into a room and fight this by putting the word of God in your mouth and speaking. Speaking till you get that victory. And uh, once you get the victory, thank God, praise God, and then uh, what next? Don't think, oh, that's done. That'll never happen again. That'll never come again. No, it's gonna come again. (laughs) I'm saying all this because I feel like people sometimes think, (laughs) oh, I'm past that, I'm done, and then it comes again. They're totally surprised and shocked. No, it's gonna come again, and again, and again, and you keep fighting it, and soon enough, you'll be get used to it. You'll be like, oh, there he is, you know. As one preacher said, it seems he woke up in the middle of the night and saw the, saw the, you know, an appearance or a form of the devil or something. He said, oh, it's you again. He's so used to him, you know. It doesn't bother him at all because he knows Jesus is with him. The Holy Spirit is with him. He's not scared of the devil. Let's all stand up. God will teach us to fight. God will teach us from his word. God will make us strong mentally and spiritually. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, we worship you, Lord, for your ways are higher than our ways. Sometimes we think, why is a fight necessary? Why do we have to always be in fight mode and all these things? Why can't it just be different? But your ways are higher than our ways. You are interested in so many things that we don't even think about. You want to make us strong. You want to make us a warrior. 
you want to do great things in and through us and all these things are just leading up to some greater end you want to build up our character there are so many things lord that you have designed and help us to understand your purposes lord and you want us a, want us to be a blessing in the future to many many people and sometimes you allow us to go through circumstances just so that we can help a thousand other people in similar circumstances in the future and Lord, we thank you, Lord, for you have a wonderful plan for each and every one of us. And we pray you lead us step by step. Teach us, Lord, how to, the attitude we should have and how to fight. And Lord, give us in that moment the necessary weapons. Bring to mind your word in that moment, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for we believe we're going to experience great victory in the great days to come. As we defeat the enemy again and again for your glory, let the name of Jesus be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.